Central Intelligence Agency, Wikipedia article audio. The Central Intelligence Agency is a civilian foreign intelligence service of the United States federal government, tasked with gathering, processing, and analyzing national security information from around the world, primarily through the use of human intelligence. As one of the principal members of the U.S. intelligence community, the CIA reports to the Director of National Intelligence and is primarily focused on providing intelligence for the President and Cabinet. Unlike the Federal Bureau of Investigation, which is a domestic security service, the CIA has no law enforcement function and is mainly focused on overseas intelligence gathering with only limited domestic intelligence collection. Though it is not the only U.S. government agency specializing in HUMINT, the CIA serves as the national manager for coordination of HUMINT activities across the U.S. intelligence community. Moreover, the CIA is the only agency authorized by law to carry out and oversee covered action at the behest of the President. It exerts foreign political influence through its tactical divisions, such as the Special Activities Division. Purpose Organizational Structure Before the Intelligence Reform and Terrorism Prevention Act of 2004, the CIA director concurrently served as the head of the intelligence community, today. The CIA is organized under the Director of National Intelligence. Despite transferring some of its powers to the DNI, the CIA has grown in size as a result of the September 11 attacks. In 2013, The Washington Post reported that in fiscal year 2010, the CIA had the largest budget of all IC agencies, exceeding previous estimates. The CIA has increasingly expanded its role, including covered paramilitary operations. One of its largest divisions, the Information Operations Center, has shifted focus from counterterrorism to offensive cyber operations. When the CIA was created, its purpose was to create a clearinghouse for foreign policy intelligence and analysis. Today its primary purpose is to collect, analyze, evaluate, and disseminate foreign intelligence, and to perform covered actions. According to its fiscal 2013 budget, the CIA has five priorities. The CIA has an executive office and five major directorates. Executive Office the director of the Central Intelligence Agency is appointed by the President with Senate confirmation and reports directly to the Director of National Intelligence. In practice, the CIA director interfaces with the Director of National Intelligence, Congress, and the White House, while the Deputy Director is the internal executive of the CIA and the Chief Operating Officer known as Executive Director until 2017, leads the day-to-day -day work as the third highest post of the CIA. The Deputy Director is formally appointed by the Director without Senate confirmation, but as the President's opinion plays a great role in the decision, the Deputy Director is generally considered a political position, making the chief operating officer the most senior non-political position for CIA career officers. The executive office also supports the U.S. military by providing it with information it gathers, receiving information from military intelligence organizations, and cooperates on field activities. The executive director is in charge of the day-to-day -day operation of the CIA. Each branch of the military service has its own director. The Associate Director of Military Affairs, a senior military officer, manages the relationship between the CIA and the Unified Combatant Commands, who produce and deliver to the CIA regional-slash-operational intelligence and consume national intelligence produced by the CIA. 
Directorate of Analysis The Directorate of Analysis, through much of its history known as the Directorate of Intelligence, is tasked with helping the President and other policymakers make informed decisions about our country's Euro trademark's national security by looking at all the available information on an issue and organize it for policymakers. The Directorate has four regional analytic groups six groups for transnational issues, and three that focus on policy, collection, and staff support. There is an office dedicated to Iraq, regional analytical offices covering the Near East and South Asia, Russia, and Europe, and the Asian Pacific, Latin American, and African office. The Directorate of Operations is responsible for collecting foreign intelligence, and for covert action. The name reflects its role as the coordinator of human intelligence activities between other elements of the wider U.S. intelligence community with their own human operations. This directorate was created in an attempt to end years of rivalry over influence, philosophy, and budget between the United States Department of Defense and the CIA. In spite of this, the Department of Defense recently organized its own global clandestine intelligence service, the Defense Clandestine Service, under the Defense Intelligence Agency. This directorate is known to be organized by geographic regions and issues, but its precise organization is classified. Directorate of Operations the Directorate of Science and Technology was established to research, create, and manage technical collection disciplines and equipment. Many of its innovations were transferred to other intelligence organizations, or, as they became more overt, to the military services. Directorate of Science and Technology For example, the development of the U-2 high-altitude reconnaissance aircraft was done in cooperation with the United States Air Force. The U-2's original mission was clandestine imagery intelligence over denied areas such as the Soviet Union. It was subsequently provided with signals intelligence and measurement and signature intelligence capabilities, and is now operated by the Air Force. Directorate of Support Imagery intelligence collected by the U-2 and reconnaissance satellites was analyzed by a DSNT organization called the National Photo Interpretation Center, which had analysts from both the CIA and the military services. Subsequently, NPIC was transferred to the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. The Directorate of Support has organizational and administrative functions to significant units including Training The CIA established its first training facility, the Office of Training and Education, in 1950. Following the end of the Cold War, the CIA's training budget was slashed, which had a negative effect on employee retention. In response, Director of Central Intelligence George Tenet established CIA University in 2002. CIA University holds between 200 and 300 courses each year, training both new hires and experienced intelligence officers, as well as CIA support staff. The facility works in partnership with the National Intelligence University, and includes the Sherman Kent School for Intelligence Analysis, the Directorate of Analysis component of the university. For later stage training of student operations officers, there is at least one classified training area at Camp Peary, near Williamsburg, Virginia. Students are selected, and their progress evaluated, in ways derived from the OSS, published as the book Assessment of Men, Selection of Personnel for the Office of Strategic Services. Additional mission training is conducted at Harvey Point, North Carolina.
The primary training facility for the Office of Communications is Warrington Training Center, located near Warrington, Virginia. The facility was established in 1951 and has been used by the CIA since at least 1955. Details of the overall United States intelligence budget are classified. Under the Central Intelligence Agency Act of 1949, the Director of Central Intelligence is the only federal government employee who can spend unvouchered government money. The government showed its 1997 budget was $26.6 billion for the fiscal year. The government has disclosed a total figure for all non-military intelligence spending since 2007, the fiscal 2013 figure is $52.6 billion. According to the 2013 mass surveillance disclosures, the CIA's fiscal 2013 budget is $14.7 billion. 28% of the total and almost 50% more than the budget of the National Security Agency. CIA's human budget is $2.3 billion, the SIGINT budget is $1.7 billion, and spending for security and logistics of CIA missions is $2.5 billion. Covered Action Programs including a variety of activities such as the CIA's drone fleet and anti-Iranian nuclear program activities, accounts for $2.6 billion. There were numerous previous attempts to obtain general information about the budget. As a result, it was revealed that CIA's annual budget in fiscal year 1963 was U.S. $550 million, and the overall intelligence budget in FI 1997 was US $26.6 billion. There have been accidental disclosures, for instance, Mary Margaret Graham, a former CIA official and deputy director of National Intelligence for Collection in 2005, said that the annual intelligence budget was $44 billion, and in 1994 Congress accidentally published a budget of $43.4 billion in 1994 for the non-military national intelligence program, including $4.8 billion for the CIA. After the Marshall Plan was approved, appropriating $13.7 billion over five years, 5% of those funds or $685 million were made available to the CIA. Budget Robert Baer, a CNN analyst and former CIA operative, stated that normally a CIA employee undergoes a polygraph examination every three to four years. Employees the CIA acts as the primary U.S. human and general analytic agency, under the Director of National Intelligence, who directs or coordinates the 16 member organizations of the United States intelligence community. In addition, it obtains information from other U.S. government intelligence agencies, commercial information sources, and foreign intelligence services. Counterterrorism, the top priority, nonproliferation of nuclear and other weapons of mass destruction, warning slash informing American leaders of important overseas events, counterintelligence, cyber intelligence. CIA employees form part of the National Reconnaissance Office Workforce originally created as a joint office of the CIA and U.S. Air Force to operate the spy satellites of the U.S. military. The Special Collections Service is a joint CIA and National Security Agency office that conducts clandestine electronic surveillance in embassies and hostile territory throughout the world. The Directorate of Digital Innovation, the Directorate of Analysis, the Directorate of Operations, the Directorate of Support, the Directorate of Science and Technology. 
The role and functions of the CIA are roughly equivalent to those of the United Kingdom Secret Intelligence Service, the Australian Secret Intelligence Service, the French Foreign Intelligence Service Direction GA Copyright NA Copyright Rall de la SA Copyright Curita Copyright X to Copyright Ruer, the Russian Foreign Intelligence Service, the Chinese Ministry of State Security, the Indian Research and Analysis Wing, the Pakistani Inter Services Intelligence, the Egyptian General Intelligence Service, and Israel's Mossad. While the preceding agencies both collect and analyze information, some like the U.S. State Department's Bureau of Intelligence and Research are purely analytical agencies. Polygraphing Relationship with other intelligence agencies U.S. agencies Foreign intelligence services The closest links of the USIC to other foreign intelligence agencies are to Anglophone countries, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, and the United Kingdom. There is a special communications marking that signals that intelligence-related messages can be shared with these four countries. An indication of the United States' close operational cooperation is the creation of a new message distribution label within the main U.S. military communications network. Previously, the marking of NAFORN required the originator to specify which, if any, non-U.S. countries could receive the information. A new handling caveat, USA slash AUS slash Ken slash GBR slash NZL 5 eyes, used primarily on intelligence messages, gives an easier way to indicate that the material can be shared with Australia, Canada, United Kingdom, and New Zealand. The Office of Security the Office of Communications, the Office of Information Technology. The task of the division called Verbindungsstelle 61 of the German Bundesnachrichtendienst is keeping contact to the CIA office in Wiesbaden. Ireland's Directorate of Military Intelligence liaises with the CIA, although it is not a member of the Five Eyes. The Central Intelligence Agency was created on July 26, 1947, when Harry S. Truman signed the National Security Act into law. A major impetus for the creation of the CIA was the unforeseen attack on Pearl Harbor. In addition, towards the end of World War II the U.S. government felt the need for a group to coordinate intelligence efforts. The success of the British commandos during World War II prompted U.S. President Franklin D. Roosevelt to authorize the creation of an intelligence service modeled after the British Secret Intelligence Service, and Special Operations Executive. This led to the creation of the Office of Strategic Services. On September 20, 1945, shortly after the end of World War II, Harry S. Truman signed an executive order dissolving the OSS, and by October 1945 its functions had been divided between the Departments of State and War. The division lasted only a few months. The first public mention of the Central Intelligence Agency appeared on a command restructuring proposal presented by Jim Forrestal and Arthur Radford to the U.S. Senate Military Affairs Committee at the end of 1945. Despite opposition from the military establishment, the United States Department of State and the Federal Bureau of Investigation, Truman established the National Intelligence Authority in January 1946. Its operational extension was known as the Central Intelligence Group, which was the direct predecessor of the CIA. Different Standards for Government Employees and Contractors, Contractors Providing Similar Services to Government Workers, Analysis of Costs of Contractors versus Employees an assessment of the appropriateness of outsourced activities, an estimate of the number of contracts and contractors, 
Comparison of Compensation for Contractors and Government Employees, Attrition Analysis of Government Employees, Descriptions of Positions to be Converted Back to the Employee Model, An Evaluation of Accountability. Mechanisms, An Evaluation of Procedures for Conducting Oversight of Contractors to Ensure Identification and Prosecution of Criminal Violations, Financial Waste, fraud or other abuses committed by contractors or contract personnel, and, an identification of best practices of accountability mechanisms within service contracts. Lawrence Houston, head counsel of the SU, SIG, and, later CIA, was principal draftsman of the National Security Act of 1947, which dissolved the NIA and the SIG and established both the National Security Council and the Central Intelligence Agency. In 1949 Houston helped to draft the Central Intelligence Agency Act, which authorized the agency to use confidential fiscal and administrative procedures, and exempted it from most limitations on the use of federal funds. It also exempted the CIA from having to disclose its organization, functions, officials, titles, salaries, or numbers of personnel employed. It created the program PL-110 to handle defectors and other essential aliens who fell outside normal immigration procedures. At the outset of the Korean War the CIA still only had a few thousand employees a thousand of whom worked in analysis. Intelligence primarily came from the Office of Reports and Estimates, which drew its reports from a daily take of State Department telegrams, military dispatches, and other public documents. The CIA still lacked its own intelligence-gathering abilities. On August 21, 1950, Shortly after the invasion of South Korea, Truman announced Walter Bedell Smith as the new director of the CIA to correct what was seen as a grave failure of intelligence. The CIA had different demands placed on it by the different bodies overseeing it. Truman wanted a centralized group to organize the information that reached him, the Department of Defense wanted military intelligence and covered action and the State Department wanted to create global political change favorable to the U.S. Thus the two areas of responsibility for the CIA were covered action and covered intelligence. One of the main targets for intelligence gathering was the Soviet Union, which had also been a priority of the CIA's predecessors. History United States Air Force General Hoyt Vandenberg the SIG's second director, created the Office of Special Operations, as well as the Office of Reports and Estimates. Initially the OSO was tasked with spying and subversion overseas with a budget of $15 million, the largest of a small number of patrons in Congress. Vandenberg's goals were much like the ones set out by his predecessor, finding out everything about the Soviet forces in Eastern and Central Europe a Euro their movements, their capabilities, and their intentions. On June 18, 1948, the National Security Council issued Directive 10 halves calling for covered action against the USSR, and granting the authority to carry out covered operations against hostile foreign states or groups that could, if needed, be denied by the U.S. government. To this end, the Office of Policy Coordination was created inside the new CIA. The OPC was quite unique, Frank Wisner, the head of the OPC, answered not to the CIA director, but to the secretaries of defense, state, and the NSC, and the OPC's actions were a secret even from the head of the CIA. Most CIA stations had two station chiefs, one working for the OSO, and one working for the OPC. The early track record of the CIA was poor, 
with the agency unable to provide sufficient intelligence about the Soviet takeovers of Romania and Czechoslovakia, the Soviet blockade of Berlin, and the Soviet atomic bomb project. In particular, the agency failed to predict the Chinese entry into the Korean War with 300,000 troops. The famous double agent Kim Philby was the British liaison to American Central Intelligence. Through him the CIA coordinated hundreds of airdrops inside the Iron Curtain, all compromised by Philby. Arlington Hall, the nerve center of CIA cryptanalysis, was compromised by Bill Weisband, a Russian translator and Soviet spy. Immediate Predecessors National Security Act Intelligence versus Action However, the CIA was successful in influencing the 1948 Italian election in favor of the Christian Democrats. The $200 million Exchange Stabilization Fund, earmarked for the reconstruction of Europe, was used to pay wealthy Americans of Italian heritage. Cash was then distributed to Catholic Action, the Vatican's political arm, and directly to Italian politicians. This tactic of using its large fund to purchase elections was frequently repeated in the subsequent years. At the beginning of the Korean War, CIA officer Hans Toft claimed to have turned a thousand North Korean expatriates into a guerrilla force tasked with infiltration, guerrilla warfare, and pilot rescue. In 1952 the CIA sent 1,500 more expatriate agents north. Seoul Station Chief Albert Haney would openly celebrate the capabilities of those agents, and the information they sent. In September 1952 Haney was replaced by John Limond Hart, a Europe veteran with a vivid memory for bitter experiences of misinformation. Hart was suspicious of the parade of successes reported by Toft and Haney and launched an investigation which determined that the entirety of the information supplied by the Korean sources was false or misleading. After the war, internal reviews by the CIA would corroborate Hart's findings. The CIA's Seoul station had 200 officers, but not a single speaker of Korean. Hart reported to Washington that Seoul Station was hopeless, and could not be salvaged. Loftus Becker, Deputy Director of Intelligence, was sent personally to tell Hart that the CIA had to keep the station open to save face. Becker returned to Washington, pronounced the situation to be hopeless, and that, after touring the CIA's Far East operations, the CIA's ability to gather intelligence in the Far East was almost negligible. He then resigned. Air Force Colonel James Callis stated that CIA Director Alan Dulles continued to praise the CIA's Korean force, despite knowing that they were under enemy control. When China entered the war in 1950, the CIA attempted a number of subversive operations in the country all of which failed due to the presence of double agents. Millions of dollars were spent in these efforts. These included a team of young CIA officers airdropped into China who were ambushed, and CIA funds being used to set up a global heroin empire in Burma's Golden Triangle following a betrayal by another double agent. In 1951, Mohammad Mozadig a member of the National Front, was elected Iranian Prime Minister. As Prime Minister, he nationalized the Anglo-Iranian oil company which his predecessor had supported. The nationalization of the British-funded Iranian oil industry, including the largest oil refinery in the world, was disastrous for Mossadegh. A British naval embargo closed the British oil facilities which Iran had no skilled workers to operate. In 1952 Mozadig resisted the royal refusal to approve his Minister of War, and resigned in protest. 
the National Front took to the streets in protest. Fearing a loss of control, the military pulled its troops back five days later, and the Shah gave in to Mozadiga's demands. Mozadiga quickly replaced military leaders loyal to the Shah with those loyal to him, giving him personal control over the military. Given six months of emergency powers, Mozadiga unilaterally passed legislation. When that six months expired, his powers were extended for another year. In 1953 Mossadegh dismissed parliament and assumed dictatorial powers. This power grab triggered the Shah to exercise his constitutional right to dismiss Mozadegh. Mozadegh launched a military coup as the Shah fled the country. As was typical of CIA operations, CIA interventions were preceded by radio announcements on July 7, 1953 made by the CIA's intended victim by way of operational leaks. On August 19, a CIA-paid mob led by Ayatollah Ruhollah Khomeini would spark what a U.S. embassy officer called an almost spontaneous revolution but Mozadig was protected by his new inner military circle, and the CIA had been unable to gain influence within the Iranian military. Their chosen man, former General Fazlala Zahidi, had no troops to call on. General McClure, commander of the American Military Assistance Advisory Group, would get his second star buying the loyalty of the Iranian officers he was training. An attack on his house would force Mossadegh to flee. He surrendered the next day, and his coup came to an end. The end result would be a 60-40th oil profit split in favor of Iran. The return of the Shah to power, and the impression, cultivated by Alan Dulles, that an effective CIA had been able to guide that nation to friendly and stable relations with the West triggered planning for Operation Lb Success, a plan to overthrow Guatemalan President Jacobo Arbenz. The plan was exposed in major newspapers before it happened after a CIA agent left plans for the coup in his Guatemala City hotel room. The Guatemalan Revolution of 1944 a Euro 54 overthrew the U.S.-backed dictator Jorge Ubico and brought a democratically elected government to power. The government began an ambitious agrarian reform program attempting to grant land to millions of landless peasants. This program threatened the land holdings of the United Fruit Company, who lobbied for a coup by portraying these reforms as communist. Korean War On June 18, 1954, Carlos Castillo Armas led 480 CIA-trained men across the border from Honduras into Guatemala. The weapons had also come from the CIA. The CIA also mounted a psychological campaign to convince the Guatemalan people and government that Armas' victory was a fait accompli, the largest part of which was a radio broadcast entitled The Voice of Liberation which announced that Guatemalan exiles led by Castillo Armas were shortly about to liberate the country. On June 25, a CIA plane bombed Guatemala City destroying the government's main oil reserves. Arbenz ordered the army to distribute weapons to local peasants and workers. The army refused, forcing Jacobo Arbenz's resignation on June 27, 1954. Arbenz handed over power to Colonel Carlos Enrique Diaz. The CIA then orchestrated a series of power transfers that ended with the confirmation of Castillo Armas as president in July 1954. Armas was the first in a series of military dictators that would rule the country, triggering the brutal Guatemalan civil war in which some 200,000 people were killed, mostly by the U.S. backed military. In 1949, Colonel Adib Shishakli rose to power in Syria in a CIA-backed coup. Four years later, 
he would be overthrown by the military, Baathists, and communists. The CIA and MI6 started funding right-wing members of the military, but suffered a large setback in the aftermath of the Suez Crisis. CIA agent Rocky Stone, who had played a minor role in the Iranian Revolution, was working at the Damascus Embassy as a diplomat, but was actually the station chief. Syrian officers on the CIA dole quickly appeared on television stating that they had received money from corrupt and sinister Americans in an attempt to overthrow the legitimate government of Syria. Syrian forces surrounded the embassy and rousted Agent Stone, who confessed and subsequently made history as the first American diplomat expelled from an Arab nation. This strengthened ties between Syria and Egypt helping establish the United Arab Republic, and poisoning the well for the U.S. for the foreseeable future. The charismatic leader of Indonesia was President Sukarno. His declaration of neutrality in the Cold War put the suspicions of the CIA on him. After Sukarno hosted Bandung Conference, promoting the non-aligned movement, the Eisenhower White House responded with NSC 5518 authorizing all feasible covered means to move Indonesia into the Western sphere. The U.S. had no clear policy on Indonesia. Ike sent his Special Assistant for Security Operations, F. M. Dearborn Jr., to Jakarta. His report that there was great instability, and that the U.S. lacked stable allies, reinforced the domino theory. Indonesia suffered from what he described as subversion by democracy. The CIA decided to attempt another military coup in Indonesia, where the Indonesian military was trained by the U.S., had a strong professional relationship with the U.S. military, had a pro-American officer corps that strongly supported their government, and a strong belief in civilian control of the military, instilled partly by its close association with the U.S. military. On September 25, 1957, Eisenhower ordered the CIA to start a revolution in Indonesia with the goal of regime change. Three days later, Blitz, a Soviet-controlled weekly in India, reported that the U.S. was plotting to overthrow Sukarno. The story was picked up by the media in Indonesia. One of the first parts of the operation was an 11,500-ton U.S. Navy ship landing at Sumatra, delivering weapons for as many as 8,000 potential revolutionaries. The CIA described Agent Al Pope's bombing and strafing of Indonesia in a CIA B-26 to the president as attacks by dissident planes. Pope's B-26 was shot down over Embon, Indonesia on May 18, 1958, and he bailed out. When he was captured, the Indonesian military found his personnel records, after action reports and his membership card for the Officers Club at Clark Field. On March 9, Foster Dulles, the Secretary of State, and brother of DCI Alan Dulles, made a public statement calling for a revolt against communist despotism under Sukarno. Three days later, the CIA reported to the White House that the Indonesian Army's actions against CIA-instigated revolution was suppressing communism. After Indonesia, Eisenhower displayed mistrust of both the CIA and its director, Alan Dulles. Dulles too displayed mistrust of the CIA itself. Abbott Smith a CIA analyst who later became chief of the Office of National Estimates, said, We had constructed for ourselves a picture of the USSR, and whatever happened had to be made to fit into this picture. Intelligence estimators can hardly commit a more abominable sin. Something reflected in the intelligence failure in Indonesia. On December 16, 
Eisenhower received a report from his intelligence board of consultants that said the agency was incapable of making objective appraisals of its own intelligence information as well as its own operations. In the election of Patrice Lumumba, and his acceptance of Soviet support the CIA saw another possible Cuba. This view swayed the White House. Ike ordered that Lumumba be eliminated. The CIA delivered a quarter of a million dollars to Joseph Mobutu, their favored Congolese political figure. Mobutu delivered Lumumba to the Belgians, the former colonial masters of Congo, who executed him in short order. After the bomber gap came the missile gap. Eisenhower wanted to use the U-2 to disprove the missile gap but he had banned U-2 overflights of the USSR after meeting Secretary Khrushchev at Camp David. Another reason the president objected to the use of the U-2 was that, in the nuclear age, the intelligence he needed most was on their intentions, without which, the US would face a paralysis of intelligence. He was particularly worried that U-2 flights could be seen as preparations for first strike attacks. He had high hopes for an upcoming meeting with Khrushchev in Paris. Eisenhower finally gave in to CIA pressure to authorize a 16-day window for flights, which was extended an additional six days because of poor weather. On May 1, 1960, the USSR shot down a U-2 flying over the Soviet territory. To Eisenhower, the ensuing cover-up destroyed his perceived honesty, and his hope of leaving a legacy of thawing relations with Khrushchev. It would also mark the beginning of a long downward slide in the credibility of the office of the President of the United States. Eisenhower later said that the U-2 cover-up was the greatest regret of his presidency, 160. The human rights abuses of Generalissimo Rafael Trujillo had a history of more than three decades, but in August 1960 the United States severed diplomatic relations. The CIA's special group had decided to arm Dominicans in hopes of an assassination. The CIA had dispersed three rifles, and three .38 revolvers, but things paused as Kennedy assumed office. An order approved by Kennedy resulted in the dispersal of four machine guns. Trujillo died from gunshot wounds two weeks later. In the aftermath, Robert Kennedy wrote that the CIA had succeeded where it had failed many times in the past, but in the face of that success, it was caught flatfoot, having failed to plan what to do next. 1953 Iranian coup d'a copyright tat. 1954 Guatemalan coup d'a copyright tat. The CIA welcomed Fidel Castro on his visit to DC and gave him a face-to-face -face briefing. The CIA hoped that Castro would bring about a friendly democratic government and planned to curry his favor with money and guns. On December 11, 1959, a memo reached the DCI's desk recommending Castro's elimination. Dulles replaced the word elimination with removal, and set the wheels in motion. By mid-August 1960, Dick Bissell would seek, with the blessing of the CIA, to hire the Mafia to assassinate Castro. The Bay of Pigs invasion was a failed military invasion of Cuba undertaken by the CIA-sponsored paramilitary group Brigade 2506 on April 17, 1961. A counter-revolutionary military, trained and funded by the CIA, Brigade 2506 fronted the armed wing of the Democratic Revolutionary Front and intended to overthrow the increasingly communist government of Fidel Castro. Launched from Guatemala, the invading force was defeated within three days by the Cuban Revolutionary Armed Forces, under the direct command of Prime Minister Fidel Castro. 
U.S. President Dwight D. Eisenhower was concerned at the direction Castro's government was taking, and in March 1960, Eisenhower allocated $13.1 million to the CIA to plan Castro's overthrow. The CIA proceeded to organize the operation with the aid of various Cuban counter-revolutionary forces, training Brigade 2506 in Guatemala. Over 1,400 paramilitaries set out for Cuba by boat on April 13. Two days later on April 15, eight CIA-supplied B-26 bombers attacked Cuban airfields. On the night of April 16, the main invasion landed in the Bay of Pigs, but by April 20, the invaders finally surrendered. The failed invasion strengthened the position of Castro's leadership as well as his ties with the USSR. This led eventually to the events of the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962. The invasion was a major embarrassment for U.S. foreign policy. U.S. President John F. Kennedy ordered a number of internal investigations across Latin America. Syria The Taylor Board was commissioned to determine what went wrong in Cuba. The board came to the same conclusion that the January 61 President's Board of Consultants on Foreign Intelligence Activities had concluded, and many other reviews prior, and to come, that covert action had to be completely isolated from intelligence and analysis. The Inspector General of the CIA investigated the Bay of Pigs. His conclusion was that there was a need to drastically improve the organization and management of the CIA. The special group was convened in an oversight role. Indonesia Congo Gary Powers U-2 Shoot Down Dominican Republic Bay of Pigs Early Cold War 1953 A Euro 1966 Indochina, Tibet, and the Vietnam War Johnson Nixon Congressional Investigations Chad Afghanistan Iran-Contra Lebanon the CIA was involved in anti-communist activities in Burma, Guatemala, and Laos. There have been suggestions that the Soviet attempt to put missiles into Cuba came, indirectly, when they realized how badly they had been compromised by a U.S.U.K. defector in place, Oleg Penkovsky. One of the biggest operations ever undertaken by the CIA was directed at Zari in support of general-turned-dictator Mobutu Sisi Siko. The OSS Paddy mission arrived in Vietnam near the end of World War II, and had significant interaction with the leaders of many Vietnamese factions, including Ho Chi Minh. The CIA Tibetan program consists of political plots, propaganda distribution, as well as paramilitary and intelligence gathering based on U.S. commitments made to the Dalai Lama in 1951 and 1956. During the period of U.S. combat involvement in the Vietnam War, there was considerable argument about progress among the Department of Defense under Robert McNamara, the CIA, and, to some extent, the intelligence staff of Military Assistance Command Vietnam. Sometime between 1959 and 1961 the CIA started Project Tiger, a program of dropping South Vietnamese agents into North Vietnam to gather intelligence. These were failures, the deputy chief for Project Tiger, Captain Du Van Tien, admitted that he was an agent for Hanoi. In the face of the failure of Project Tiger, the Pentagon wanted CIA paramilitary forces to participate in their OP Plan 64A, this resulted in the CIA's foreign paramilitaries being put under the command of the DOD, 
a move seen as a slippery slope inside the CIA, a slide from covert action towards militarization. A CIA analyst's assessment of Vietnam was that the U.S. was becoming progressively divorced from reality, proceeding with far more courage than wisdom. In 1971, the NSA and CIA were engaged in domestic spying. The Dodd was eavesdropping on Kissinger. The White House and Camp David were wired for sound. Nixon and Kissinger were eavesdropping on their aides, as well as reporters. Famously, Nixon's plumbers had in their number many former CIA agents, including Howard Hunt, Jim McCord, and Eugenio Martinez. On July 7, 1971, John Ehrlichman, Nixon's domestic policy chief, told DCI Cushman, Nixon's hatchet man in the CIA, to let Cushman know that was in fact doing some things for the president, you should consider he has pretty much carte blanche importantly, this included a camera, disguises, a voice-altering device, and ID papers furnished by the CIA, as well as the CIA's participation developing film from the burglary hunt staged on the office of Pentagon Papers leaker Daniel Ellsberg S. Psychologist On June 17, Nixon's plumbers were caught burglarizing the DNC offices in the Watergate. On June 23, DCI Helms was ordered by the White House to wave the FBI off using national security as a pretext. The new DCI, Walters, another Nixon hack, called the acting director of the FBI and told him to drop the investigation as ordered. On June 26, Nixon's counsel John Dean ordered DCI Walters to pay the plumbers untraceable hush money. The CIA was the only part of the government that had the power to make off the book payments, but it could only be done on the orders of the CI, or, if he was out of the country, the DCI. The acting director of the FBI started breaking ranks. He demanded the CIA produce a signed document attesting to the national security threat of the investigation. Jim McCord's lawyer contacted the CIA informing them that McCord had been offered a presidential pardon if he fingered the CIA, testifying that the break-in had been an operation of the CIA. Nixon had long been frustrated by what he saw as a liberal infection inside the CIA, and had been trying for years to tear the CIA out by its roots. McCord wrote if Helms goes and the Watergate operation is laid at the CIA's feet, where it does not belong, every tree in the forest will fall. It will be a scorched desert. On November 13, after Nixon's landslide re-election, Nixon told Kissinger to ruin the Foreign Service. I mean ruin it a euro the old Foreign Service a euro and to build a new one. He had similar designs for the CIA, and intended to replace Helms with James Schlesinger. Nixon had told Helms that he was on the way out, and promised that Helms could stay on until his 60th birthday, the mandatory retirement age. On February 2, Nixon broke that promise, carrying through with his intention to remove the deadwood from the CIA. Get rid of the clowns was his order to the incoming CI. Kissinger had been running the CIA since the beginning of Nixon's presidency, but Nixon impressed on Schlesinger that he must appear to Congress to be in charge, averting their suspicion of Kissinger's involvement. Nixon also hoped that Schlesinger could push through broader changes in the intelligence community that he had been working towards for years the creation of a director of national intelligence, and spinning off the covert action part of the CIA into a separate organ. Before Helms would leave office, he would destroy every tape he had secretly made of meetings in his office, and many of the papers on Project MKUltra. In Schlesinger's 17-week tenure, 
he would fire more than 1,500 employees. As Watergate threw the spotlight on the CIA, Schlesinger, who had been kept in the dark about the CIA's involvement, decided he needed to know what skeletons were in the closet. He issued a memo to every CIA employee directing them to disclose to him any CIA activity they knew of past or present that could fall outside the scope of the CIA's charter. This became the family jewels. It included information linking the CIA to the assassination of foreign leaders, the illegal surveillance of some 7,000 U.S. citizens involved in the anti-war movement, the CIA had also experimented on U.S. and Canadian citizens without their knowledge, secretly giving them LSD and observing the results. This prompted Congress to create the Church Committee in the Senate, and the Pike Committee in the House. President Gerald Ford created the Rockefeller Commission, and issued an executive order prohibiting the assassination of foreign leaders. DCI Colby leaked the papers to the press, later he stated that he believed that providing Congress with this information was the correct thing to do, and ultimately in the CIA's own interests. Acting Attorney General Lawrence Silberman learned of the existence of the family jewels, he issued a subpoena for them, prompting eight congressional investigations on the domestic spying activities of the CIA. Bill Colby's short tenure as DCI would end with the Halloween massacre. His replacement was George H.W. Bush. At the time, the Dodd had control of 80% of the intelligence budget. Communication and coordination between the CIA and the Dodd would suffer greatly under Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld. The CIA's budget for hiring clandestine officers had been squeezed out by the paramilitary operations in Southeast Asia, and hiring was further strained by the government's poor popularity. This left the agency bloated with middle management, and anemic in younger officers. With employee training taking five years, the agency's only hope would be on the trickle of new officers coming to fruition years in the future. The CIA would see another setback as communists would take Angola. William J. Casey, a member of Ford's Intelligence Advisory Board, would press Bush to allow a team from outside the CIA to produce Soviet military estimates as a Team B. Bush gave the OK. The B team was composed of Hawks. Their estimates were the highest that could be justified, and they painted a picture of a growing Soviet military when the Soviet military was actually shrinking. Many of their reports found their way to the press. As a result of the investigations, Congressional oversight of the CIA eventually evolved into a select intelligence committee in the House, and Senate supervising covered actions authorized by the President. Chad's neighbor Libya was a major source of weaponry to communist rebel forces. The CIA seized the opportunity to arm and finance Chad's prime minister. Hissa Ani Habra copyright after he created a breakaway government in western Sudan, even giving him Stinger missiles. In Afghanistan, the CIA funneled $40 billion worth of weapons, which included over 2,000 FIM-92 Stinger surface-to-air missiles, to Pakistani inter-services intelligence, which funneled them to almost 100,000 Afghan resistance fighters notably the Mujahideen, and foreign Afghan Arabs from 40 Muslim countries. Under President Jimmy Carter, the CIA was conducting covertly funded pro-American opposition against the Sandinista. In March 1981, Reagan told Congress that the CIA would protect El Salvador by preventing the shipment of Nicaraguan arms into the country to arm communist rebels. This was a ruse. The CIA was actually arming and training Nicaraguans Contras in Honduras in hopes that they could depose the Sandinistas in Nicaragua. 
through William J. Casey's tenure as DCI little of what he said in the National Security Planning Group, or to President Reagan was supported by the intelligence branch of the CIA, so Casey formed the Central American Task Force, staffed with yes-men from covert action. On December 21, 1982, Congress passed a law restricting the CIA to its stated mission, restricting the flow of arms from Nicaragua to El Salvador, prohibiting the use of funds to oust the Sandinistas. Reagan testified before Congress, assuring them that the CIA was not trying to topple the Nicaraguan government. The CIA's prime source in Lebanon was Bashir Jemail, a member of the Christian Maronite sect. The CIA was blinded by the uprising against the Maronite minority. Israel invaded Lebanon, and, along with the CIA, propped up Jemail. This got Jemail's assurance that Americans would be protected in Lebanon. Thirteen days later he was assassinated. Imad Mughniya, a Hezbollah assassin would target Americans in retaliation for the Israeli invasion, the Sabra and Shatila massacre, and the U.S. Marines of the multinational force for their role in opposing the PLO in Lebanon. On April 18, 1983, a 2,000 pounds car bomb exploded in the lobby of the American Embassy in Beirut, killing 63 people including 17 Americans, and seven CIA officers, including Robert Ames, one of the CIA's best Middle East experts. America's fortunes in Lebanon would only suffer more as America's poorly directed retaliation for the bombing was interpreted by many as support for the Christian Maronite minority. On October 23, 1983, two bombs were set off in Beirut, including a 10-ton bomb at a U.S. military barracks that killed 242 people. Both attacks are believed to have been planned by Iran by way of Mughniya. The embassy bombing had taken the life of the CIA's Beirut station chief, Ken Haas. Bill Buckley was sent in to replace him. Eighteen days after the U.S. Marines left Lebanon, Buckley was kidnapped. On March 7, 1984, Jeremy Levin, CNN bureau chief in Beirut was kidnapped. Twelve more Americans would be kidnapped in Beirut during the Reagan administration. Manukur Gorbanifar, a former Savak agent was an information seller, and the subject of a rare CIA burn notice for his track record of misinformation. He reached out to the agency offering a back channel to Iran, suggesting a trade of missiles that would be lucrative to the intermediaries. Unlike the Carter administration, the Reagan administration supported the Solidarity Movement in Poland, and a euro based on CIA intelligence a euro waged a public relations campaign to deter what the Carter administration felt was an imminent move by large Soviet military forces into Poland. Colonel Rizard Kuklioski, a senior officer on the Polish general staff was secretly sending reports to the CIA. The CIA transferred around $2 million yearly in cash to Solidarity, which suggests that $10 million total is a reasonable estimate for the five-year total. There were no direct links between the CIA and Solidarnosc, and all money was channeled through third parties. CIA officers were barred from meeting Solidarity leaders, and the CIA's contacts with Solidarnosc activists were weaker than those of the AFL-CIO which raised $300,000 from its members, which were used to provide material and cash directly to Solderity, with no control of Solidarity's use of it. The U.S. Congress authorized the National Endowment for Democracy to promote democracy, and the NED allocated $10 million to Solidarity. When the Polish government launched a crackdown of its own in December 1981, However, 
solidarity was not alerted. Potential explanations for this vary, some believe that the CIA was caught off guard, while others suggest that American policymakers viewed an internal crackdown as preferable to an inevitable Soviet intervention. CIA support for solidarity included money, equipment, and training, which was coordinated by Special Operations CIA Division. Henry Hyde U.S. House Intelligence Committee member, stated that USA provided supplies and technical assistance in terms of clandestine newspapers, broadcasting, propaganda, money, organizational help and advice. Michael Reisman from Yale Law School named operations in Poland as one of the covert actions of CIA during Cold War. Initial funds for covered actions by CIA were $2 million, but soon after authorization were increased and by 1985 CIA successfully infiltrated Poland Rainer Thiel and nested games of external democracy promotion, the United States and the Polish liberalization 1980A Euro 1989 mentions how covered operations by CIA and spy games among others allowed USA to proceed with successful regime change. During the Iran-Iraq War, the CIA had backed both sides. The CIA had maintained a network of spies in Iran but in 1989 a CIA mistake compromised every agent they had in there, and the CIA had no agents in Iraq. In the weeks before the invasion of Kuwait the CIA downplayed the military buildup. During the war CIA estimates of Iraqi abilities and intentions flip-flopped and were rarely accurate. In one particular case, the Dodd had asked the CIA to identify military targets to bomb. One target the CIA identified was an underground shelter. The CIA didn't know that it was a civilian bomb shelter. In a rare instance the CIA correctly determined that the coalition forces' efforts were coming up short in their efforts to destroy Scud missiles. Congress took away the CIA's role in interpreting spy satellite photos, putting the CIA's satellite intelligence operations under the auspices of the military. The CIA created its Office of Military Affairs, which operated as second echelon support for the Pentagon, answering questions from military men how wide is this road? Gorbachev's announcement of the unilateral reduction of 500,000 Soviet troops took the CIA by surprise. Moreover, Doug Mace Achen, the CIA's chief of Soviet analysis said that even if the CIA had told the President, the NSC, and Congress about the cuts beforehand, it would have been ignored. We never would have been able to publish it. All the CIA numbers on the USSR's economy were wrong. Too often the CIA relied on people inexperienced with that which they were supposed to be the expert on. Bob Gates had preceded Doug Mace Achen as chief of Soviet analysis, and he had never visited Russia. Few officers, even those stationed in country spoke the language of the people they were spying on and the CIA had no capacity to send agents to respond to developing situations. The CIA analysis of Russia during the entire Cold War was either driven by ideology, or by politics. William J. Crow, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, noted that the CIA talked about the Soviet Union as if they weren't reading the newspapers, much less developed clandestine intelligence. On January 25, 1993, Mir Kazi opened fire at the CIA headquarters in Langley, Virginia, killing two agents and wounding three others. On February 26, Al-Qaeda terrorists led by Ramzi Youssef bombed the parking garage below the North Tower of the World Trade Center in New York City killing six people and injuring 1,402 others. During the Bosnian War, 
the CIA ignored signs within and without of the Srebrenica massacre. Two weeks after news reports of the slaughter, the CIA sent a U-2 to photograph it, a week later the CIA completed its report on the matter. During Operation Allied Force, the CIA had incorrectly provided the coordinates of the Chinese embassy as a Yugoslav military target resulting in its bombing. In France, the CIA had orders for economic intelligence, a female CIA agent revealed her connections to the CIA to the French. Dick Holm, Paris station chief, was expelled. In Guatemala, the CIA produced the Murphy Memo, based on audio recordings made by bugs planted by Guatemalan intelligence in the bedroom of Ambassador Marilyn McAfee. In the recording, Ambassador McAfee verbally entreated Murphy. The CIA circulated a memo in the highest Washington circles accusing Ambassador McAfee of having an extramarital lesbian affair with her secretary, Carol Murphy. There was no affair. Ambassador McAfee was calling to Murphy, her poodle. Harold James Nicholson would burn several serving officers and three years of trainees before he was caught spying for Russia. In 1997 the House would pen another report, which said that CIA officers know little about the language or politics of the people they spy on, the conclusion was that the CIA lacked the depth, breadth and expertise to monitor political, military, and economic developments worldwide. Russ Traverse said in the CIA in-house journal that in five years intelligence failure is inevitable. In 1997 the CIA's new director George Tenet would promise a new working agency by 2002. The CIA's surprise at India's detonation of an atom bomb was a failure at almost every level. After the 1998 embassy bombings by Al-Qaeda, the CIA offered two targets to be hit in retaliation. One of them was the Al-Shifa pharmaceutical factory, where traces of chemical weapon precursors had been detected. In the aftermath it was concluded that the decision to target Al-Shifa continues a tradition of operating on inadequate intelligence about Sudan. It triggered the CIA to make substantial and sweeping changes to prevent a catastrophic systemic intelligence failure. Between 1991 and 1998 the CIA lost 3,000 employees. Between 1985 and 1986 the CIA lost every spy it had in Eastern Europe. The details of the investigation into the cause were obscured from the new director and the investigation had little success, and has been widely criticized. In June 1987, Major Florentino Aspilaga Lombard, the chief of Cuban intelligence in Czechoslovakia drove into Vienna, and walked into the American embassy to defect. He revealed that every single Cuban spy on the CIA payroll was a double agent, pretending to work for the CIA but secretly still being loyal to Castro. On February 21, 1994, FBI agents pulled Aldrich James out of his Jaguar. In the investigation that ensued, the CIA discovered that many of the sources for its most important analyses of the USSR were based on Soviet disinformation fed to the CIA by controlled agents. On top of that, it was discovered that, in some cases, the CIA suspected at the time that the sources were compromised, but the information was sent up the chain as genuine. Agency files show that it is believed Osama bin Laden was funding the Afghan rebels against the USSR in the 1980s. In 1991, bin Laden returned to his native Saudi Arabia protesting the presence of troops an Operation Desert Storm. He was expelled from the country. In 1996 the CIA created a team to hunt bin Laden. 
They were trading information with the Sudanese until, on the word of a source that would later be found to be a fabricator, the CIA closed its Sudan station later that year. In 1998 Bin Laden would declare war on America, and, on August 7, strike in Tanzania and Nairobi. On October 12, 2000, Al-Qaeda bombed the USS Cole. In 1947 when the CIA was founded, there were 200 agents in the clandestine service. In 2001, of the 17,000 employees in the CIA, there were 1,000 in the clandestine service. Of that 1,000 few would accept hardship postings. In the first days of George W. Bush's presidency, Al-Qaeda threats were ubiquitous in daily presidential CIA briefings, but it may have become a case of the boy who cries wolf. The agency's predictions were dire, but carried little weight, and the attentions of the president and his defense staff were elsewhere. The CIA arranged the arrests of suspected Al-Qaeda members through cooperation with foreign agencies, but the CIA could not definitively say what effect these arrests had had, and it could not gain hard intelligence from those captured. The president had asked the CIA if Al-Qaeda could plan attacks in the U.S. On August 6, Bush received a daily briefing with the headline, not based on current, solid intelligence, Al-Qaeda determined to strike inside the U.S. The U.S. had been hunting bin Laden since 1996 and had had several opportunities, but neither Clinton, nor Bush had wanted to risk their skin taking an active role in a murky assassination plot, and the perfect opportunity had never materialized for a trigger-shy DCI that would have given him the reassurances he needed to take the plunge. That day, Richard A. Clark sent National Security Advisor Condoleezza Rice warning of the risks, and decrying the inaction of the CIA. The CIA had long been dealing with terrorism originating from abroad, and in 1986 had set up a counter-terrorist center to deal specifically with the problem. At first confronted with secular terrorism, the agency found Islamist terrorism looming increasingly large on its scope. In January 1996, the CIA created an experimental virtual station, the Bin Laden Issue Station, under the counter-terrorist center, to track bin Laden's developing activities. Al Fadl, who defected to the CIA in spring 1996, began to provide the station with a new image of the Al Qaeda leader. He was not only a terrorist financier, but a terrorist organizer, too. FBI Special Agent Dan Coleman called him Qaeda's Rosetta Stone. In 1999, CIA Chief George Tenet launched a grand plan to deal with Al-Qaeda. The Counter-Terrorist Center, its new chief Kofer Black and the center's Bin Laden unit were the plan's developers and executors. Once it was prepared Tenet assigned CIA Intelligence Chief Charles E. Allen to set up a Qaeda cell to oversee its tactical execution. In 2000, the CIA and U.S. Air Force jointly ran a series of flights over Afghanistan with a small remote-controlled reconnaissance drone, the Predator, they obtained probable photos of Bin Laden. Kofor Black and others became advocates of arming the Predator with missiles to try to assassinate Bin Laden and other Al-Qaeda leaders. After the Cabinet-level Principals Committee meeting on terrorism of September 4, 2001, the CIA resumed reconnaissance flights, the drones now being weapons capable. On September 11, 2001, 19 Al Qaeda members hijacked four passenger jets within the northeastern United States in a series of coordinated terrorist attacks. Two planes crashed into the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center in New York City 
III into the Pentagon in Arlington County, Virginia, and the IV inadvertently into a field near Shanksville, Pennsylvania. The attacks cost the lives of 2,996 people, caused the destruction of the Twin Towers, and damaged the western side of the Pentagon. Soon after 9-11, the New York Times released a story stating that the CIA's New York field office was destroyed in the wake of the attacks. According to unnamed CIA sources, while first responders, military personnel and volunteers were conducting rescue efforts at the World Trade Center site, a special CIA team was searching the rubble for both digital and paper copies of classified documents. This was done according to well-rehearsed document recovery procedures put in place after the Iranian takeover of the United States Embassy in Tehran in 1979. While it was not confirmed whether the agency was able to retrieve the classified information, it is known that all agents present that day fled the building safely. While the CIA insists that those who conducted the attacks on September 11 were not aware that the agency was operating at 7 World Trade Center under the guise of another federal agency, this center was the headquarters for many notable criminal terrorism investigations. Though the New York field office's main responsibilities were to monitor and recruit foreign officials stationed at the United Nations, the field office also handled the investigations of the August 1998 bombings of United States embassies in East Africa and the October 2000 bombing of the USS Cole. Despite the fact that the CIA's New York branch may have been damaged by the 9-11 attacks and they had to loan office space from the U.S. mission to the United Nations and other federal agencies, there was an upside for the CIA. In the months immediately following 9-11, there was a huge increase in the number of applications for CIA positions. According to CIA representatives that spoke with the New York Times, pre-9-11 the agency received approximately 500 to 600 applications a week, in the months following 9-11 the agency received that number daily. The intelligence community as a whole, and especially the CIA, were involved in presidential planning immediately after the 9-11 attacks. In his address to the nation at 8.30 p.m. on September 11, 2001, George W. Bush mentioned the intelligence community, the search is underway for those who are behind these evil acts, I've directed the full resource of our intelligence and law enforcement communities to find those responsible and bring them to justice. The involvement of the CIA in the newly coined War on Terror was further increased on September 15, 2001. During a meeting at Camp David George W. Bush agreed to adopt a plan proposed by CIA Director George Tenet. This plan consisted of conducting a covert war in which CIA paramilitary officers would cooperate with anti-Taliban guerrillas inside Afghanistan. They would later be joined by small special operations forces teams which would call in precision airstrikes on Taliban and Al-Qaeda fighters. This plan was codified on September 16, 2001 with Bush's signature of an official memorandum of notification that allowed the plan to proceed. On November 25 a Euro 27, 2001, Taliban prisoners revolted at the Kalajangi prison west of mazar e sharif Though several days of struggle occurred between the Taliban prisoners and the Northern Alliance members present, the prisoners did gain the upper hand and obtain North Alliance weapons. At some point during this period Johnny Mike Spann, a CIA officer sent to question the prisoners, was beaten to death. He became the first American to die in combat in the war in Afghanistan. After 9-11, the CIA came under criticism for not having done enough to prevent the attacks. 
Tenet rejected the criticism, citing the agency's planning efforts especially over the preceding two years. He also considered that the CIA's efforts had put the agency in a position to respond rapidly and effectively to the attacks, both in the Afghan sanctuary and in 92 countries around the world. The new strategy was called the Worldwide Attack Matrix. Anwar Alalaki, a Yemeni-American U.S. citizen and Al-Qaeda member, was killed on September 30, 2011, by an air attack carried out by the Joint Special Operations Command. After several days of surveillance of Alaki by the Central Intelligence Agency, armed drones took off from a new, secret American base in the Arabian Peninsula, crossed into northern Yemen, and fired a number of Hellfire missiles at Alalaki's vehicle. Samir Khan a Pakistani-American Al-Qaeda member and editor of the jihadist Inspire magazine, also reportedly died in the attack. The combined CIA-JSOC drone strike was the first in Yemen since 2002 a Euro there have been others by the military's Special Operations Forces a Euro and was part of an effort by the spy agency to duplicate in Yemen the covered war which has been running in Afghanistan and Pakistan. The agency attracted widespread criticism after it used a doctor in Pakistan to set up a vaccination program in Abbott Abbott in 2011 to obtain DNA samples from the occupants of a compound where it was suspected bin Laden was living. A major criticism is failure to forestall the September 11 attacks. The 9-11's Commission report identifies failures in the IC as a whole. One problem, for example, was the FBI failing to connect the dots by sharing information among its decentralized field offices. The report concluded that former DCI George Tenet failed to adequately prepare the agency to deal with the danger posed by Al-Qaeda prior to the attacks of September 11, 2001. The report was finished in June 2005 and was partially released to the public in an agreement with Congress, over the objections of current DCI General Michael Hayden. Hayden said its publication would consume time and attention revisiting ground that is already well plowed. Tenet disagreed with the report's conclusions, citing his planning efforts vis-a-vis -vis Al Qaeda particularly from 1999. Conditions worsened in the mid-1970s, around the time of Watergate. A dominant feature of political life during that period were the attempts of Congress to assert oversight of the U.S. presidency and the executive branch of the U.S. government. Revelations about past CIA activities such as assassinations and attempted assassinations of foreign leaders and illegal domestic spying on U.S. citizens, provided the opportunities to increase congressional oversight of U.S. intelligence operations. CIA involvement in Contra cocaine trafficking in Nicaragua and complicity in the actions of the death squads in El Salvador and Honduras also came to light. Hastening the CIA's fall from grace were the burglary of the Watergate headquarters of the Democratic Party by former CIA officers, and President Richard Nixon's subsequent attempt to use the CIA to impede the FBI's investigation of the burglary. In the famous smoking gun recording that led to President Nixon's resignation, Nixon ordered his chief of staff, H.R. Haldeman, to tell the CIA that further investigation of Watergate would open the whole can of worms about the Bay of Pigs invasion of Cuba. In this way Nixon and Haldeman ensured that the CIA's number one and number two ranking officials, Richard Helms and Vernon Walters, communicated to FBI Director L. Patrick Gray that the FBI should not follow the money trail from the burglars to the committee to re-elect the president as it would uncover CIA informants in Mexico. 
The FBI initially agreed to this due to a long-standing agreement between the FBI and CIA not to uncover each other's sources of information, though within a couple of weeks the FBI demanded this request in writing, and when no such formal request came, the FBI resumed its investigation into the money trail. Nonetheless, when the smoking gun tapes were made public, damage to the public's perception of CIA's top officials, and thus to the CIA as a whole, could not be avoided. Repercussions from the Iran-Contra affair arms smuggling scandal included the creation of the Intelligence Authorization Act in 1991. It defined covert operations as secret missions in geopolitical areas where the U.S. is neither openly nor apparently engaged. This also required an authorizing chain of command, including an official, presidential finding report and the informing of the House and Senate Intelligence Committees, which, in emergencies, requires only timely notification. Seventy-two days after the 9-11 attacks President Bush told his Secretary of Defense to update the U.S. plan for an invasion of Iraq, but not to tell anyone. SEC Def Rumsfeld asked Bush if he could bring DCI Tenet into the loop, to which Bush agreed. Feelers the CIA had put out to Iraq in the form of eight of their best officers in Kurdish territory in northern Iraq hit a gold mine unprecedented in the famously closed, almost fascist Hussein government. By December 2002 the CIA had close to a dozen good networks in Iraq, 242 and would advance so far that they would penetrate Iraq's SSO, and even tap the encrypted communications of the deputy prime minister, even the bodyguard of Hussein's son became an agent. As time passed, the CIA would become more and more frantic about the possibility of their networks being compromised, rolled up. To the CIA, the invasion had to occur before the end of February 2003 if their sources inside Hussein's government were to survive. The roll-up would happen as predicted, 37 CIA sources recognized by their Thuraya satellite telephones provided for them by the CIA. 337. The case Colin Powell presented before the United Nations was wishful thinking. DDCI John E. McLaughlin was part of a long discussion in the CIA about equivocation. McLaughlin, who would make, among others, the slam dunk presentation to the president, felt that they had to dare to be wrong to be clearer in their judgments. 197 The Al-Qaeda connection, for instance, was from a single source, extracted through torture, and was later denied. Curveball was a known liar, and the sole source for the mobile chemical weapons factories. A postmortem of the intelligence failures in the lead-up to Iraq led by former DDCI Richard Kerr would conclude that the CIA had been a casualty of the Cold War wiped out in a way analogous to the effect of the meteor strikes on the dinosaurs. The opening days of the invasion of Iraq would see successes and defeats for the CIA. With its Iraq networks compromised, and its strategic and tactical information shallow, and often wrong, the intelligence side of the invasion itself would be a black eye for the agency. The CIA would see some success with its Scorpion paramilitary teams composed of CIA Special Activities Division agents, along with friendly Iraqi partisans. CIA SAD officers would also help the U.S. 10th Special Forces. The occupation of Iraq would be a low point in the history of the CIA. At the largest CIA station in the world agents would rotate through 1 a Euro 3 month tours. In Iraq almost 500 transient agents would be trapped inside the green zone while Iraq station chiefs would rotate with only a little less frequency.
The Intelligence Reform and Terrorism Prevention Act of 2004 created the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, who took over some of the government and intelligence community-wide functions that had previously been the CIA's. The DNI manages the United States intelligence community and in so doing it manages the intelligence cycle. Among the functions that moved to the DNI were the preparation of estimates reflecting the consolidated opinion of the 16 IC agencies, and preparation of briefings for the President. On July 30, 2008, President Bush issued Executive Order 13470 amending Executive Order 12333 to strengthen the role of the DNI. Previously, the Director of Central Intelligence oversaw the intelligence community, serving as the President's principal intelligence advisor, additionally serving as head of the CIA. The DCI's title now is Director of the Central Intelligence Agency, serving as head of the CIA. Currently, the CIA reports to the Director of National Intelligence. Prior to the establishment of the DNI, the CIA reported to the President, with informational briefings to congressional committees. The National Security Advisor is a permanent member of the National Security Council, responsible for briefing the President with pertinent information collected by all U.S. intelligence agencies, including the National Security Agency, the Drug Enforcement Administration, etc. All 16 intelligence community agencies are under the authority of the Director of National Intelligence. On May 1, 2011, President Barack Obama announced that Osama bin Laden was killed earlier that day by a small team of Americans operating in Abbott Abbott, Pakistan, during a CIA operation. The raid was executed from a CIA forward base in Afghanistan by elements of the U.S. Navy's Naval Special Warfare Development Group and CIA paramilitary operatives. It resulted in the acquisition of extensive intelligence on the future attack plans of Al-Qaeda. The operation was a result of years of intelligence work that included the CIA's capture and interrogation of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed which led to the identity of a courier of bin Laden's, the tracking of the courier to the compound by Special Activities Division paramilitary operatives and the establishing of a CIA safe house to provide critical tactical intelligence for the operation. Under the aegis of Operation Timber Sycamore and other clandestine activities, CIA operatives and U.S. Special Operations troops have trained and armed nearly 10,000 rebel fighters at a cost of $1 billion a year. The CIA has been sending weapons to anti-government rebels in Syria since at least 2012. These weapons have been reportedly falling into hands of extremists such as Al-Nusra Front and ISIL. Around February 2017, the CIA was instructed to halt military aid to Syrian rebels, which also included training, ammunition, guided missiles, and salaries. Sources state that the hold on aid was not related to the transitions from Obama's administration to Trump's, but rather due to issues faced by the FSA. Based on responses by rebel officials, they believe that the aid freeze is related to concerns that weapons and funds will fall into the hands of ISIL. Based on information obtained by Reuters, five FSA groups have confirmed that they received funding and military support from an source called Mom Operations Room. Several countries besides the U.S. had also contributed to the funding of the FSA. These countries include Turkey, Qatar, and Saudi Arabia. On April 6, 2017, Al Jazeera reported that funding to the FSA was partially restored. Based on information provided by two FSA sources, 
the new military operation room will receive its funds from the Coalition Friends of Syria. The coalition consists of members from the US, Turkey, Western Europe, and Gulf states, which previously supported the military operation known as MOM. It was reported in July 2017 that President Donald Trump had ordered a phasing out of the CIA's support for anti-Assad rebels. On March 6, 2015, the Office of the D-CIA issued an unclassified edition of a statement by the director, titled Our Agency's Blueprint for the Future, as a press release for public consumption. The press release announced sweeping plans for the reorganization and reform of the CIA, which the director believes will bring the CIA more in line with the agency doctrine called the Strategic Direction. Among the principal changes disclosed include the establishment of a new directorate, the Directorate of Digital Innovation, which is responsible for designing and crafting the digital technology to be used by the agency, to keep the CIA always ahead of its enemies. The Directorate of Digital Innovation will also train CIA staff in the use of this technology, to prepare the CIA for the future and it will also use the technological revolution to deal with cyberterrorism and other perceived threats. The new directorate will be the chief cyber espionage arm of the agency going forward. Other changes which were announced include the formation of a Talent Development Center of Excellence, the enhancement and expansion of the CIA University and the creation of the Office of the Chancellor to head the CIA University in order to consolidate and unify recruitment and training efforts. The Office of the Executive Director will be empowered and expanded and the secretarial offices serving the Executive Director will be streamlined. The restructuring of the entire agency is to be revamped according to a new model whereby governance is modeled after the structure and hierarchy of corporations, said to increase the efficiency of workflow and to greatly enable the executive director to manage day-to-day -day activity. As well, another stated intention was to establish mission centers, each one to deal with a specific geographic region of the world which will bring the full collaboration and joint efforts of the five directorates together under one roof. While the directorate heads will still retain ultimate authority over their respective directorate, the mission centers will be led by an assistant director who will work with the capabilities and talents of all five directorates on mission-specific goals for the parts of the world which they are given responsibility for. The unclassified version of the document ends with the announcement that the National Clandestine Service will be reverting to its original directorate name, the Directorate of Operations. The Directorate of Intelligence is also being renamed, it will now be the Directorate of Analysis. Poland 1980A Euro 89 Operation Desert Storm Fall of the USSR President Clinton Aldrich Ames Osama Bin Laden Al-Qaeda and the Global War on Terrorism Use of Vaccination Programs A new policy introduced by President Barack Obama removed the authority of the CIA to launch drone attacks and allowed these attacks only under Department of Defense Command. This change was reversed by President Donald Trump, who authorized CIA drone strikes on suspected terrorists. Until the 2004 reorganization of the intelligence community, one of the services of common concern that the CIA provided was open-source intelligence from the Foreign Broadcast Information Service FBIS which had absorbed the Joint Publication Research Service, a military organization that translated documents, moved into the National Open Source Enterprise under the Director of National Intelligence. During the Reagan administration, Michael Sikora, 
worked with agencies across the intelligence community, including the CIA, to develop and deploy a technology-based competitive strategy system called Project Socrates. Project Socrates was designed to utilize open-source intelligence gathering almost exclusively. The technology-focused Socrates system supported such programs as the Strategic Defense Initiative in addition to private sector projects. As part of its mandate to gather intelligence, the CIA is looking increasingly online for information, and has become a major consumer of social media. We're looking at YouTube, which carries some unique and honest-to-goodness intelligence, said Doug Naquin, director of the DNI Open Source Center at CIA headquarters. We're looking at chat rooms and things that didn't exist five years ago, and trying to stay ahead. CIA launched a Twitter account in June 2014. Many of the duties and functions of intelligence community activities, not the CIA alone, are being outsourced and privatized. Mike McConnell, former director of National Intelligence, was about to publicize an investigation report of outsourcing by U.S. intelligence agencies, as required by Congress. However, this report was then classified. Hillhouse speculates that this report includes requirements for the CIA to report. According to investigative journalist Tim Shorick, What we have today with the intelligence business is something far more systemic, senior officials leaving their national security and counterterrorism jobs for positions where they are basically doing the same jobs they once held at the CIA, the NSA, and other agencies a euro but for double or triple the salary, and for profit. It's a privatization of the highest order, in which our collective memory and experience in intelligence a euro are crown jewels of spying, so to speak a euro are owned by corporate America. Yet, there is essentially no government oversight of this private sector at the heart of our intelligence empire. And the lines between public and private have become so blurred as to be non-existent. Congress had required an outsourcing report by March 30, 2008. The Director of National Intelligence has been granted the authority to increase the number of positions on elements in the intelligence community by up to 10% should there be a determination that activities performed by a contractor should be done by a U.S. government employee. Part of the contracting problem comes from congressional restrictions on the number of employees in the IC. According to Hillhouse, this resulted in 70% of the de facto workforce of the CIA's National Clandestine Service being made up of contractors. After years of contributing to the increasing reliance upon contractors, Congress is now providing a framework for the conversion of contractors into federal government employees a euro more or less. As with most government agencies, building equipment often is contracted. The National Reconnaissance Office, responsible for the development and operation of airborne and spaceborne sensors, long was a joint operation of the CIA and the United States Department of Defense. NRO had been significantly involved in the design of such sensors, but the NRO, then under DCI authority, contracted more of the design that had been their tradition, and to a contractor without extensive reconnaissance experience, Boeing. The next generation satellite future imagery architecture project How Does Heaven Look, which missed objectives after $4 billion in cost overruns, was the result of this contract. Some of the cost problems associated with intelligence come from one agency, or even a group within an agency, not accepting the compartmented security practices for individual projects, requiring expensive duplication. The CIA, a forgotten history, 
by William Bloom and Legacy of Ashes, the history of the CIA by Tim Weiner have accused the CIA of various covert actions, and human rights abuses. The CIA has responded to the claims made in Weiner's book, and Jeffrey T. Richelson of the National Security Archive has also been critical of it. Intelligence expert David Wise faulted Weiner for portraying Alan Dulles as a doddering old man rather than the shrewd professional spy he knew and for refusing to concede that the agency's leaders may have acted from patriotic motives or that the CIA ever did anything right, but concluded, Legacy of Ashes succeeds as both journalism and history and it is must-reading for anyone interested in the CIA or American intelligence since World War II. In 2017, the CIA faced heat over WikiLeaks. They released a statement saying they conduct missions to aggressively collect intelligence, but denied the authenticity of the cables released by WikiLeaks. In 1969, at the height of the anti-war movement in the U.S., CIA Director Helms received a message from Henry Kissinger ordering him to spy on the leaders of the groups requesting a moratorium on Vietnam. Since 1962, three successive presidents had ordered the Director of Central Intelligence to spy on Americans. Extraordinary rendition is the apprehension and extrajudicial transfer of a person from one country to another. The term torture by proxy is used by some critics to describe situations in which the CIA and other U.S. agencies have transferred suspected terrorists to countries known to employ torture, whether they meant to enable torture or not. It has been claimed, though that torture has been employed with the knowledge or acquiescence of U.S. agencies, although Condoleezza Rice stated that the United States has not transported anyone, and will not transport anyone, to a country when we believe he will be tortured. Where appropriate, the United States seeks assurances that transferred persons will not be tortured. Whilst the Obama administration has tried to distance itself from some of the harshest counterterrorism techniques, it has also said that at least some forms of renditions will continue. The administration continued to allow rendition only to a country with jurisdiction over that individual when there is a diplomatic assurance that they will not be treated inhumanely. The U.S. program has also prompted several official investigations in Europe into alleged secret detentions and unlawful interstate transfers involving Council of Europe member states. A June 2006 report from the Council of Europe estimated 100 people had been kidnapped by the CIA on EU territory, and rendered to other countries often after having transited through secret detention centers used by the CIA, some located in Europe. According to the separate European Parliament report of February 2007, the CIA has conducted 1,245 flights, many of them to destinations where suspects could face torture, in violation of Article 3 of the United Nations Convention Against Torture. Following the September 11 attacks the United States, in particular the CIA, has been accused of rendering hundreds of people suspected by the government of being terrorists a euro or of aiding and abetting terrorist organizations a euro to third-party states such as Egypt, Jordan, Morocco and Uzbekistan. Such ghost detainees are kept outside judicial oversight often without ever entering U.S. territory, and may or may not ultimately be devolved to the custody of the United States. On October 4, 2001, a secret arrangement was made in Brussels, by all members of NATO. Lord George Robertson, British Defence Secretary and later NATO's Secretary-General, 
would later explain that NATO members agree to provide blanket overflight clearances for the United States and other allies' aircraft for military flights related to operations against terrorism. On December 30, 2009, a suicide attack occurred in the forward operating base Chapman attack in the province of Khost, Afghanistan. Seven CIA officers, including the chief of the base, were killed and six others seriously wounded in the attack. Perhaps the most disruptive period involving counterintelligence was James Jesus Angleton's search for a mole, based on the statements of a Soviet defector, Anatoly Igolitsyn. A second defector, Yuri Nozenko, challenged Golitsyn's claims with the two calling one another Soviet double agents. Many CIA officers fell under career-ending suspicion, the details of the relative truths and untruths from Nozenko and Galitsyn may never be released, or, in fact, may not be fully understood. The accusations also crossed the Atlantic to the British intelligence services, who also were damaged by mole hunts. Edward Lee Howard, David Henry Barnett, both field operations officers sold secrets to Russia, and William Camp Isles, a low-level worker in the CIA 24-hour operations center. Camp Isles sold the Soviets the detailed operational manual for the KH-11 reconnaissance satellite. The CIA has been called into question for, at times, using torture, funding and training of groups and organizations that would later participate in killing of civilians and other non-combatants and would try or succeed in overthrowing democratically elected governments, human experimentation and targeted killings and assassinations. The CIA has also been accused of a lack of financial and whistleblower controls which has led to waste and fraud. The Institute on Medicine as a Profession and the non-profit organization Open Society Foundations reviewed public records into the medical professions alleging complicity in the abuse of prisoners suspected of terrorism who were held in U.S. custody during the years after 9-11. The reports found that health professionals aided cruel and degrading interrogations, helped devise and implement practices designed to maximize disorientation and anxiety so as to make detainees more malleable for interrogation, and participated in the application of excruciatingly painful methods of force-feeding of mentally competent detainees carrying out hunger strikes are not all that surprising. Medical professionals were sometimes used at black sites to monitor detainee health. Whether or not the physicians were compelled is an open question. Other human rights issues that are controversial include the case of Edward Snowden. However, the significance of human right does not fall into this case regarding whether Snowden received his fair trial or not. Rather, the human rights associated with the Snowden leaks are regarding the types of documents Snowden released. Snowden released a significant amount of information on the U.S. government's surveillance program of its citizens to the Washington Post as well as foreign news reporters. Particularly, between on or about June 5, 2013, and June 9, 2013, Classified information was published on the Internet and in print by multiple newspapers, including The Washington Post and The Guardian. The articles and Internet postings by The Washington Post and The Guardian included classified documents that were marked top secret. The Washington Post and The Guardian later revealed that Snowden was the principal source for the classified information on or about June 9. 2013, in a videotaped interview with The Guardian, admitted that he was the person who illegally provided those documents to reporters. Evidence indicates that Snowden had access to the classified documents in question, accessed those documents, and, subsequently, 
provided those documents to media outlets without authorization and in violation of U.S. law. Furthermore, the leaks included documents at many levels of the National Security Agency electronic surveillance activities. The Snowden leaks have generated broad public debate over issues of security, privacy, and legality inherent in the NSA's surveillance of communications by American citizens. The records include, White House and ODNI efforts to explain, justify, and defend the programs, correspondence between outside critics and executive branch officials, fact sheets and white papers distributed by the government, key laws and court decisions, documents on the Total Information Awareness Program, an earlier proposal for massive data collection manuals on how to exploit the Internet for intelligence. Several investigations have been conducted about the CIA, and many documents have been declassified. The CIA sometimes finds itself in conflict with other parts of the government when there is disagreement over the legality of specific covered programs. There is always the risk that one part of the government may make the covered operations of another part of the government public. Two offices of CIA Directorate of Analysis have analytical responsibilities in this area. The Office of Transnational Issues applies unique functional expertise to assess existing and emerging threats to U.S. national security and provides the most senior U.S. policymakers, military planners, and law enforcement with analysis, warning, and crisis support. CIA Crime and Narcotics Center researches information on international narcotics trafficking and organized crime for policymakers and the law enforcement community. Since CIA has no domestic police authority, it sends its analytic information to the Federal Bureau of Investigation, Immigration, and Customs Enforcement and other law enforcement organizations such as the Drug Enforcement Administration and the Office of Foreign Assets Control of the United States Department of the Treasury. Another part of CIA, the Directorate of Operations, collects human intelligence in these areas. Research by Dr. Alfred W. McCoy, Gary Webb, and others has pointed to CIA involvement in narcotics trafficking across the globe although the CIA officially denies such allegations. During the Cold War, when numerous soldiers participated in transport of Southeast Asian heroin to the United States by the airline Air America, the CIA's role in such traffic was reportedly rationalized as recapture of related profits to prevent possible enemy control of such assets. Former Speaker of the United States House of Representatives Nancy Pelosi has stated that the CIA repeatedly misled Congress since 2001 about waterboarding and other torture, though Pelosi admitted to being told about the programs. Six members of Congress have claimed that Director of the CIA Leon Panetta admitted that over a period of several years since 2001 the CIA deceived Congress including affirmatively lying to Congress. Some congressmen believe that these lies to Congress are similar to CIA lies to Congress from earlier periods. On July 10, 2009, House Intelligence Subcommittee Chairwoman Rep. Jan Schakowsky announced the termination of an unnamed CIA-covered program described as very serious in nature which had been kept secret from Congress for eight years. CIA Director Panetta had ordered an internal investigation to determine why Congress had not been informed about the covered program. Chairman of the House Intelligence Committee Rep. Sylvester Reyes announced that he is considering an investigation into alleged CIA violations of the National Security Act, which requires with limited exception that Congress be informed of covered activities. Investigations and Oversight Subcommittee Chairwoman Schakowsky indicated that she would forward a request for congressional investigation to HPSI Chairman Sylvester Reyes. 
As mandated by Title 50 of the United States Code Chapter 15, Subchapter 3, when it becomes necessary to limit access to covered operations findings that could affect vital interests of the U.S., as soon as possible the President must report at a minimum to the Gang of Eight. The House is expected to support the 2010 Intelligence Authorization Bill including a provision that would require the President to inform more than 40 members of Congress about covered operations. The Obama administration threatened to veto the final version of a bill that included such a provision. On July 16, 2008, the fiscal 2009 Intelligence Authorization Bill was approved by House majority containing stipulations that 75% of money sought for covered actions would be held until all members of the House Intelligence Panel were briefed on sensitive covered actions. Under the George W. Bush administration, senior advisers to the President issued a statement indicating that if a bill containing this provision reached the President, they would recommend that he veto the bill. The program was rumored vis-a-vis -vis leaks made by anonymous government officials on July 23, to be an assassinations program, but this remains unconfirmed. The whole committee was stunned, I think this is as serious as it gets, stated Anna Ishu, Chairman, Subcommittee on Intelligence Community Management. U.S. House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence Failures in Intelligence Analysis Abuses of CIA Authority, 1970SA Euro 1990S Iraq War 2004, DNI takes over CIA top-level functions Operation Neptune Spear Syrian Civil War Reorganization Drones Open Source Intelligence Outsourcing and Privatization Controversies Domestic Wiretapping Extraordinary Rendition Security Failures Counterintelligence Failures Human Rights Concerns External Investigations and Document Releases Influencing Public Opinion and Law Enforcement Drug Trafficking Alleged Lying to Congress Covered Programs Hidden from Congress Intelligence Committee Investigation Improper search of computers used by Senate investigators. Resignation of officials and agents who would not work for Donald Trump. WikiLeaks disclosure of CIA's cyber tools. In fiction. Notes. Allegations by Director Panetta indicate that details of a secret counterterrorism program were withheld from Congress under orders from former U.S. Vice President Dick Cheney. This prompted Senator Feinstein and Senator Patrick Leahy, chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee to insist that no one should go outside the law. The agency hasn't discussed publicly the nature of the effort, which remains classified said agency spokesman Paul Gimigliano. The Wall Street Journal reported, citing former intelligence officials familiar with the matter, that the program was an attempt to carry out a 2001 presidential authorization to capture or kill al-Qaeda operatives. On July 17, 2009, the House Intelligence Committee said it was launching a formal investigation into the secret program. Representative Sylvester Reyes announced the probe will look into whether there was any past decision or direction to withhold information from the committee. Congresswoman Jan Schakowsky, chairman of the Subcommittee on Oversight and Investigations, who called for the investigation, stated that the investigation was intended to address CIA failures to inform Congress fully or accurately about four issues, 
CIA involvement in the downing of a missionary plane mistaken for a narcotics flight in Peru in 2001, and two matters that remain classified, as well as the rumored assassinations question. In addition, the inquiry is likely to look at the Bush administration's program of eavesdropping without warrants and its detention and interrogation program. U.S. Intelligence Chief Dennis Blair testified before the House Intelligence Committee on February 3, 2010, that the U.S. intelligence community is prepared to kill U.S. citizens if they threaten other Americans or the United States. The American Civil Liberties Union has said this policy is particularly troubling because U.S. citizens retain their constitutional right to due process even when abroad. The ACLU also expressed serious concern about the lack of public information about the policy and the potential for abuse of unchecked executive power. In July 2014 CIA Director John O. Brennan had to apologize to lawmakers because five CIA employees had surreptitiously searched Senate Intelligence Committee files and reviewed some committee staff members' email on computers that were supposed to be exclusively for congressional investigators. Brennan ordered the creation of an internal personnel board, led by former Senator Evan Bay to review the agency employees' conduct and determine potential disciplinary measures. However, according to some reports, Brennan didn't apologize for spying or doing anything wrong at all, even though his agency had been improperly accessing computers of the Senate Select Intelligence Committee and then, in the words of investigative reporter Dan Frumkin, speaking a lie. This accusation was based on the CIA director's earlier denials of Senator Dianne Feinstein's claims that the surreptitious CIA search of the SSCI computers occurred, was inappropriate, or violated the separation of powers principles embodied in the United States Constitution, including the Speech and Debate Clause or other laws. In February 2017, Reports emerged that key experts within the CIA were resigning because they would not work for U.S. President Donald Trump. The Middle East Eye reported that two agents, Americans, who operated spy rings within ISIS had resigned, because they did not want to see the contacts who worked for them sacrificed due to incompetence and anti-Muslim prejudice from within Trump's inner circle. Edward Price a CIA official since 2006, stirred controversy when he published an op-ed in the Washington Post, explaining why he surprised himself by resigning, after he perceived Trump using his visit to CIA HQ for partisan political posturing. In March 2017, WikiLeaks has published more than 8,000 documents on the CIA. The confidential documents, codenamed Vault 7, dated from 2013 AU 2016, included details on the CIA's software capabilities, such as the ability to compromise cars, smart TVs, web browsers, and the operating systems of most smartphones, as well as other operating systems such as Microsoft Windows, Mac OS, and Linux. WikiLeaks did not name the source, but said that the files had circulated among former U.S. government hackers and contractors in an unauthorized manner, one of whom has provided WikiLeaks with portions of the archive. In a 2017 speech addressing CSIS, CIA Director Mike Pompeo referred to WikiLeaks as a non-state hostile intelligence service often abetted by state actors like Russia. He also said, to give them the space to crush us with misappropriated secrets is a perversion of what our great constitution stands for. It ends now. Fictional depictions of the CIA exist in many books, films, and video games. Some fiction draws, at least in parts, on actual historical events, 
while other works are entirely fictional. The television series Chuck, was based solely on a man who accidentally sees secret CIA encryptions and eventually becomes an asset slash liability, and later on an agent in the agency. Films include Charlie Wilson's War, based on the story of U.S. Congressman Charlie Wilson and CIA operative Gust Avrakotos, who supported the Afghan Mujahideen, and The Good Shepherd, a fictional spy film produced and directed by Robert De Niro based loosely on the development of counterintelligence in the CIA. The fictional character Jack Ryan in Tom Clancy's books is a CIA analyst. Graham Greene's The Quiet American is about a CIA agent operating in Southeast Asia. Fictional depictions of the CIA are also used in video games, such as Tom Clancy's Splinter Cell, Call of Duty, Modern Warfare 2 and Call of Duty, Black Ops.